All right, thanks everyone. Um, glad to see a lot of people here. So I'm going to bring a very different perspective, and it is really what I perceive is the perspective of the communities. Uh, as I said, I've been working in these communities since '93. I have tremendous respect for uh, for the knowledge and the experience that these fishermen who risk their risk their lives every day to bring sustenance for their family. Uh, you know, I, I have respect for what they have accumulated in terms of knowledge, in terms of experience, and also in terms of passing on a livelihood that is not easy, but that brings a lot of rewards as well. So I've known several generations of fishermen by now, um, and I, you know, in my dissertation I looked at traditional ecological knowledge. I think, like many environmental anthropologists would agree with me, these fishermen are empirical scientists. Their knowledge is based on going out every day to look at the sea, to look at the different species, how the moon and the tides is gonna, are going to impact the season, if it has been raining the year before or not, all that has an impact on the quantity and the availability of targeted species. They have been observing the upper Gulf of California for generations. They talk about the impact of lack of water from the Colorado River, which doesn't flow to the Gulf anymore, and they talk about the impact on many species. Uh, so their perspective might be uh, a little contradictory, but I think it is important that we hear it, because these are the people who live there and whose, you know, whose futures are also, um, you know, it's part of the investment that they've done from previous generations as well, you know, to leave this legacy of the ability to fish and have, you know, a, a livelihood that, you know, not only brings a decent amount of money, because fishing does, but also it brings a sense of freedom of being able to be your own boss, it also brings a sense of belonging to a particular place. And the communities in the Upper Gulf have been around since the early 19, I would say 1910 or so is when you begin to see the first settlements of people. 1920 is when the communities actually form, and they form as a result of Totuaba, the Totuaba fishery, that was important from the beginning. Mm. So there's a history that is important. There is also a history uh, to conservation efforts that is important, that we need to understand. And these fishermen, Mexico is one of the few countries that has really for a long time uh, made a great effort to organize, not only, uh, you know, organize small rural producers, both in the agricultural sector but also in the fisheries sector. These fishermen have been in cooperatives for a long time. They understand management and organization. So it's not that they don't. Um, so operating in cooperatives since the 1940s, since the time of Cárdenas, has given them a lot of experience in terms of how to manage resources, how to manage also you know, money and uh, labor, etc. right? Um, so I wanted to take that into account. These are not people that don't know anything. They actually know a lot. I want to start with a quick video that we did in 2012. And we actually have a series. The last one that we did, we, we finished it um, last year, 2018. And it's a 45 minute long video that I'm not going to be able to show you here. But it really is about the position of the fishermen, but it also interviews the scientists involved. <laughs> Those who are in favor of conservation of the vaquita, those who question the way vaquita conservation has been implemented. So it tries to look at all sides, so I'll probably send you the link if people are mm -hmm. interested. I'm still, still has a few errors. This one has errors, well, a couple that I just saw, but we can ignore them. Uh, so let me start with these. So this was done in 2012. Um, I went back to the communities. I've been going in and out of the time, but uh, a lot, many times the fishermen will call me and say, hey, Marcela, can you come? This is happening. You need to document. So I go, right? And uh, I work with fishermen in very different levels from those 
who are presidents and directors of the cooperatives, uh, to those at the lowest level who have no permits, and, uh, and to those who work in the informal sector, like a lot of the women who, you know, when fishermen come, they clean the nets and they get the fish, and they, you know, so there's a lot of different jobs in fisheries that are not that evident. Uh, so let me start with that, and then I can go on to the presentation. So, so we did this one, you can start it. We did this one, then we did another one in 2014 when we look at policy makers, and then the 2018 has sort of a broad. The upper Gulf of California, Mexico, is the site of one of the most intensive single species conservation efforts in the global south. Some conservation groups aim to prevent the extinction of the elusive porpoise known as the vaquita marina. Even though the vaquita program has become one of the world's emblematic marine conservation efforts, the program has had high social and economic costs, threatening the livelihoods of more than 10,000 families. These families have depended on a sustainable fishing economy for over a century. Their voices, which up to now have been silenced, deserve to be heard. Pero en la otra que hay demasiadas restricciones, ok, estamos cuidando, como bien decíamos ahorita, un animal en peligro de extinción y vamos a acabar con un pueblo. Únicamente que tienen que echarnos la culpa a nosotros, que por nosotros se está extinguiendo la vaquita. Esa es una realidad. Tengo 32 años pescando aquí, una vez he mirado una vaquita. La, la he visto dos veces. A principio de que hace como unos 15 años que miré la última vez la, la vaquita. Pues yo no la conozco. ¿Para qué voy a decir mentiras? Yo tengo 45 años más o menos en la pesca en el mar. Anduve por todas partes. Y no sé lo que es una vaquita hoy. Es, es mucha gente que viene de San Luis, mucha gente que entra de, de los alrededores a trabajar. Es la única fuente de trabajo de la cual nosotros dependemos para la alimentación. Si no hay pesca, no hay nada. Las mujeres que trabajamos aquí es, nos aporta pues buen, buen ingreso a nuestra familia y por lo tanto pues yo miraría mal eso porque pues la gente de aquí, de eso vive, o sea, no hay más aquí más que la pesca y pues la gente que tiene sus negocios. Yo nunca he visto una vaquita, yo tengo, yo tengo 28 años pescando, yo nunca he visto una vaquita. The Vaquita Conservation Program involves the application of economic instruments on a large scale like the permanent buyout of fishing permits and the shifting into such green activities as ecotourism. Bueno, este el gobierno ha ofrecido la llama reconversión. es es una reconversión de que nos dan cierto dinero y que saquemos ese equipo de pescar. Si si hace un proyecto digamos turístico, aquí en el Golfo, no hay turismo. Esto es todo lo cuarto que me dio mi gobierno, sobre el permiso. Y pues ahí están, solos. Ustedes dando cuenta de que no hay futuro con el turismo. 
Y este es este, yo aquí vivo. Para que no estén solos. Y estos son los cuartos. Son muy pocas las fechas en que dices, ay, entra turismo al Golfo. Qué Semana Santa. Pero son muy pocas las fechas. Entonces no podemos vivir de lo que deja la Semana Santa o lo que deja la siguiente todo el año. The Vaquita Conservation Program also involves the creation of refuge zones for the vaquita, the prohibition of the most efficient shrimp net, and greatly increased surveillance and military enforcement. The program Paz de Vaquita uh, ha venido con la implementación precisamente de los polígonos de protección que empezó por un polígono pequeño y se ha extendido, extendido, a tal grado que ya nos está quedando un porcentaje muy pequeño del área de trabajo. Ahora, es una protección, creo, ficticia a, a, hacia la vaquita, porque en realidad a, hablan de, 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 de que nosotros la estamos dañando, y no es nosotros. Son los escurrimientos del río Colorado que no traen nutrientes. Nos están quitando donde podemos sacar camarón, pues. Nos están cerrando las áreas esas, que en verdad, pues, es lo que le digo, siquiera que el gobierno viniera y checara, tirara redes, tirara eso para que se fijara a ver si es cierto que hay o no hay. Porque la gente opina, opina, pero no las han visto. La libertad es lo que más importa, porque, pues, como quiera, te vas a sacar San Megas y, y, pues, mantiene la familia. Pero, ¿en el bote? ¿A dónde ya la familia? La familia es la que se... El chinchorro de línea que tradicionalmente estamos usando ahorita, el cual según las autoridades es más selectivo. Ahora quieren que vuelvamos a usar otra vez el chango, siendo que en su momento fue quitado porque destruía mucho la fauna marina. Por este tipo de chango nuevo que nosotros le llamamos ecológico, que es la misma, nada más le hicieron unas adecuaciones. Es tan sustentable este chango que no agarra nada. Como aquí, aquí está más hondo, aquí no podemos trabajar con el chango. Aquí es imposible. Nos van a quitar la fuente de trabajo. Si así, hay veces que batallamos para el sostén, porque se vienen los vientos, no salemos a pescar. The communities have serious reservations about the program's legitimacy as it fails to acknowledge other factors that impact fisheries and perhaps the vaquita. El río Colorado eh, este, tenía este salida de agua. Entonces allí en, en esas aguas se mezclaba el agua salada y el agua, el agua dulce. Allí se criaba mucho camarón. Ya últimamente que, que el río ya no tuvo agua, porque está totalmente seco, pues el camarón se escaseó. Si no hay pesca, es un círculo. Eh, no hay para el restaurante, no hay para el, los demás negocios. De alguna forma todos estamos ligados a la pesca. El trabajo por el, por, para nosotros las mujeres es este, por decir. Pero en, si en grado caso que nos quitaran por decir este trabajo, entonces ¿qué haríamos? Se nos cruzaríamos de mano porque no hay otra cosa que hacer en realidad aquí en el poblado. Mis antepasados, mis papás, mis abuelos, bisabuelos y todos hemos, han sido pescadores. Día a día yo miro las restricciones que, que le están a uno cerrando las puertas que ya no haya para dónde irse. Y yo no quiero regresar a Estados Unidos, yo quiero seguir aquí. Uh, es algo muy grande para mí, México. Y me llega un poco. Y en realidad, pues, miro muy duro que de pronto ya no nos vamos a poder mantener aquí. Me llega.
talk a little bit about the Colorado River in terms of its importance. I don't, uh, in, in terms of its importance for local livelihoods in the agricultural sector, both in the U.S. and in Mexico. Uh, you, the river basically has been mostly used for urban and agricultural use. There has been very little talk about uh, water for nature uh, in terms of the Colorado River. So basically what you see here, I don't know if I'm, ah, I'm looking at something else here. <laughs> okay. So I just, you know, we have the Mexicali Valley in Mexico and then we have Imperial Valley in California. Uh, uh, Mexico actually gets a small percentage of the Colorado River after the Treaty of 1944. I'm not going to go into detail. The U.S. US Western states get um, most of the water. Um, once it goes to Mexico, the city of Mexicali, which has about a million residents, uh, <laughs> takes a big part, and the rest is for um, agricultural purposes. In the end, very, very little water enters the Gulf of California. Um, so, in this map, you can see the area. So, you know, this is the Colorado River Delta. Pretty dry, if you go by there, you can see it. Um, as I said, historically, nobody has talked about water for nature, and so I want to highlight the work of several um, uh, agencies that have been working and finally got in 2017 recognized uh, got recognized the importance of, of water for nature. One of these organizations is the Sonoran Institute, uh, but it is the first time. And I want to quote from their website. Uh, they say when they talk about minute two, uh, 323, which is the the agreement between the U.S. and Mexico that there had to be some water for nature, although. It hasn't been specified how much or when or what will happen, but the Sonoran Institute has been able to restore some uh, areas, and I'm not going to go into that. But just quickly, I just want to highlight that um, you know estuaries are the, as they have in their website, the ocean's cradle, places where many fish and shellfish species are born and protected. These unique coastal areas where river meets the sea, fresh water intermingles with salt water, also support a multitude of plant, bird, and marine species, many of which are solely, solely found in, on unique location on the earth. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, <laughs> the, uh, about the Colorado River specifically, uh, this is one of these threatened estuaries. Research in the last two decades has shown that marine fisheries in the upper Gulf of California are dependent on freshwater flows from the delta. Twelve of the 13 species that constitute 98% of the commercial landings in the upper Gulf require brackish, low salinity water during their early development. So the point is, the fishermen are not the only ones who think that lack of water from the Colorado River has, co has completely changed uh, the ecosystem, and that has impacts. They don't know. If, they are not saying that that's the cause of Paquita decline because they really don't know. They, as you saw, they they always say that they have hardly ever seen a Paquita, and this narrative has been the same since since the first time I went to the Gulf in 1992, when I started asking fishermen about the Paquita. This is before the reserve, before anybody talked about it, and fishermen will say, "Well, we don't know what you're talking about." So I would try to describe, and no, 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 we don't know what you're talking about. And it's, that narrative hasn't changed at all. Mm. So, um, okay, well, I'm going to skip all this because it's too much. Uh, so what fishermen are saying, for example, in terms of lack of water from the Colorado River, is that they are seeing um, species of white, they are seeing white shark in the upper Gulf. White shark is that is coming in through the Pacific into the Gulf of California. They had never seen white shark. It's, a, it's an animal that requires higher salinity, and that's why the fishermen say that the species are changing. That now you have species that are more, you know, that belong more to the, the sea, the open sea, or the, you know, other parts of the Gulf of California where salinity is a lot higher. There's uh, several species that have completely disappeared. One of them is, is white shrimp. 
that used to be very abundant in the Gulf and now in the upper Gulf, and now you hardly see it. Uh, there are, you know, fisheries are still going on and there is still enough to sustain fishermen. They know there has been a decline in fisheries and they have a lot of ideas about how to create sustainable fisheries. The problem with the, with the issue of the conservation of the vaquita is that it is an all or nothing situation. And that is where my problem, you know, lies. And I think not only mine, but I'm gonna skip all this. Uh, so, okay, let's begin here a little bit about the Totua, since we, uh, uh, Osmar was talking about the Totua. Uh, as I said, this town started because of the Totua fishery. Uh, may, mainly Germans, Americans, and Chinese started exploiting the Totua. The swim bladder was exported to China. The, the flesh was used for export to uh, markets in California. And you can see the totuaba is what, what biologists call a catchable fish. It's very easy to catch. It doesn't move fast, and if, if somebody catches a totuaba, the totuabas come to see what's going on. These are the accounts of fishermen who used to catch. And, and you can see here a photo. No, so, the, huh? No, it's there, so but you can't see the photo. <laughs> it's hard to see. Because there are tons of Totua in that picture. This is a picture from the 1930s. And these are huge fish. And um, so you can see, okay, so here you can see exports to California, changes in exports from 77,000 kilos in 1924 to 2,300 kilos in 1941-42. In the 1950s, the, the fishery starts to collapse because it was being too much. It's catchability, it's too easy to catch, right? Um, so in the 1970s, Mexico declared Totua an endangered species and prohibits the uh, fishing of Totua. So let's leave it as that for now. And you can see on this one, you can see how the, the fishery completely declined, right? So let's leave that there and we'll go back to it. Uh, so let me tell you then a little bit about the community. Oh, that's about the community. Uh, okay. So these are, you know, pictures of the, of the uh, you know, communities there. Um, I, as I said, there are about 10,000 families that are depending on fisheries. There is nothing else. Imagine a place that has less than six inches of rain a year. So compared to the upper Gulf, this is a paradise of rain. <laughs> no, but no, you know, it doesn't rain, period. There is absolutely no chance of agriculture. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about tourism because it is important to also understand how tourism has been, you know, tried to be inserted many times and it hasn't worked. Um, so, you know, to understand conservation, then let's go back a little bit in history, and actually conservation started in 1992-93 with the signing of NAFTA. So you're gonna see what does NAFTA have to do, what does the free trade agreement has to do with conservation. You have the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation as a side agreement that was signed uh, right after NAFTA in 1993. And it required that Mexico show that it cared about conservation. <coughs> so that's when Mexico really starts getting into conservation. Um, that's from their website. And I just want to read from the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation that still continues with the new free trade agreement, the, what is it, U.S.-Mexico, U.S.-Canada-Mexico, what is it? Something, something, something. something. Well, the environmental agreement conti continues, and I was looking at it, and the interesting part is that it, it's only focusing on fishing communities. And I was asking why, and I, so I asked uh, one of our lawyers here at the university, why is this so? And he said, well, he didn't know, but he said, I think it has to do with the Pacific Trade Agreement that never got off the ground, where all the several countries of the Pacific were going to have free trade agreement. And of course, Pacific uh, countries very much depend on fisheries. So he said, that's a leftover from that. 
dream that never happened. So I don't know. I it's I, I really don't know why why that is why fisheries have continued to be the focus of conservation in such a big place as Mexico. But anyway, so you have in '93 the creation of the Biosphere Reserve. All of a sudden, the, 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 the Gulf of California, from being considered a highly productive region, becomes one containing several fragile ecosystems in need <coughs> of conservation. And I am talking about the government's narrative, right? Which was always proud of all the production in the Gulf of California, one of the most productive regions, blah, blah. So all of a sudden, is in need of conservation. We have the Biosphere Reserve. One of the, of the very positive things that came out of the creation of the biosphere is that they stopped uh, the large uh, shrimp boats from going into the upper Gulf. And that was actually a really good thing because they, uh, they burrow into the mud and they catch everything in their, you know, so, so the area is too shallow to be, to be having uh, these big boats. And they were coming from all over the Gulf. California. So that was actually a positive, a positive situation, and I think artisanal fishermen were happy that that was happening. Uh, in '95, in the Gulf of California, you have six more protected areas. By 2000, and this is the entire Gulf, there are 19 protected areas in the Upper Gulf. So this happened very quickly. This idea that we had to have biosphere reserves and. The other thing that was happening at the same time, because remember this is NAFTA and at the same time environmental side agreement, the Mexico is saying, well, we have to produce a lot, free markets need to let us decide what we're going to do, and we are going to promote sustainable development in the, upper, in the Gulf of California, including the upper Gulf. So you have uh, the creation of more than 20,000 hectares in um, semi-intensive shrimp aquaculture, most of those operations are no longer viable. And I remember when this was happening, and, and I remember talking to one of the managers of one of, the, of, one of these uh, shrimp aquaculture operations. He was from Ecuador. And I was looking at it and I was saying that they were, the, the water, they were taking water from the sea and into the, into the uh, shrimp aquaculture farm. Then you have to put a lot of antibiotics and stuff because these are densely populated, you know, densely yeah, populated areas with shrimp, so a lot of disease and contamination happens. And then they were throwing the water in the estuaries, the same place where they collected water they were throwing it. So I asked, what, what is going on? And he said, well, they are making the same stupid mistakes that we made in Ecuador. They are going to destroy the... the Mangles, the <laughs> and they are putting all this stuff into the environment. But that was sustainable development for the Mexican government at the time. Uh, so they didn't quite work. The other one was the nautical staircase. Bring all these people from California that were going to have their boats and everybody was going to be happy. And then fishermen were going to do tourism. They built tons of hotels. If you go to Rocky Point, Puerto Peñasco, you're going to see them. Most of them are abandoned. Um, nothing happened, right? It didn't work. Um, so, you know, the idea was the Gulf of California has the highest potential at the national level to develop nautical tourism as a result of its high biodiversity to the wealth of sports fishing, to the scenic valley of the coast, and to the favorable conditions of na for navigation. None of that happened. Then we go, let's go then to, to Vaquita, the Vaquita program. Vaquita starts to become increasingly the focus of attention in terms of conservation. In 2005, you begin to see the creation of a refuge zone, uh, the polygono for the Vaquita. So fishermen, they were uh, restricted from entering that area. Um, then you have in 2008 the development of the Pase Maquita program. You see, and this is the, and, and then we enter into a phase of you know buyout programs in terms of licenses. What was Mario was talking about? Um, they were giving uh, fishermen money to build little houses for tourism, and this is an example of those houses. Some of them were in the middle of nowhere without any fresh water. So I saw all of these, right? They had to buy specific materials to, buy, to, to build these, so that was also problematic. A lot of them, 
I talked to older fishermen who said, well, I'm going to retire anyway. And they gave out away their licenses. Other people had somebody ill in their family and, oh my God, they're going to give me $20,000. Yes. Without realizing that in the process they were going to end up becoming illegal because they lost their boats, their licenses, right? So that's how it sort of began. 2012 is when I go. Uh, they are talking about changing the nets. And I know a lot about these nets because when I was doing my dissertation, I was actually... The, no, this is too much. I'm not going to have time for this. But the nets that they are proposing, which are suriperas, really don't work in the upper gulf. Uh, the wind doesn't work. And economically, it doesn't work either if you compare to the Chinchorro de Linea, which is the, the, the long uh, nets that they use that are very thin, that actually are, are very efficient. And I've done some studies of them because they were trying to prohibit them in the mid-Gulf of California in Guaymas in the 1990s. And I did a, a little, you know, study with the fishermen on how, you know, that they only really catch big shrimp. Uh, very little by catch. But anyway, so 2012, they are still fishing. 2015, uh, the Diario Oficial says the fishermen cannot fish. Fishing in the upper Gulf is completely bad. <coughs> That's it. No one can fish. It's been almost four years, and the communities are suffering. They have not stayed quiet. There have been many strikes. Uh, there has been a lot of activity against what is happening. Um, they've gone to Mexico City. They so there has been a lot of of, of out you know very vocal complaints. Uh, not only by the fishermen, but some uh, Mexican scientists have also been part of, 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 of this move to say, hey, let's look at these more carefully. Four years, and, or almost four, and the decline of Vasita continues. I just want to just say one more thing, because I think it is important when we think about conservation. I think there are um, ways of con different ways to conserve resources, and the type of conservation of the Vasita has several characteristics that I think are important to understand, and that's why they are uh, controversial. It's, it's, a, it's an effort that is uh, based on payment for ecosystem services, which these are ma market-oriented projects for the conservation of biological diversity, right? So uh, payment for ecosystem services assumes that resources uh, use and conserve, that resource use are incompatible with conservation. Right? The argument that natural environment can best be protected by valuing and managing it at nature's services. That's something that you can buy and sell, uh, a tradable commodity. So you provide uh, monetary compensation uh, in exchange for fishermen shifting to selling artesanías, crafts, or, or making a little bungalow for a hotel. Um, so that's the idea behind it, right? Uh, it hasn't worked, it didn't work, so it's a problem in the upper Gulf of California. So uh, rather than looking at preservation of ecosystems on a broad scale, single species approaches to conservation management focused on saving individual charismatic species that are located within highly fluid and dynamic, multiple-use natural context. So that's one of the issues. The other issue uh, is, oh, sorry, I shifted to single species. That was single species. That's the second one. Uh, it has drawn a lot of criticism among conservationists who argue that this view is far too narrow. For conservation to succeed, some environmentalists argue it must work on a larger scale, focusing not on preserving single species in small islands of wilderness, but on large landscapes and entire ecosystems, as well as on the benefits that nature provides to humans. Um, so, in other words, co uh, uh, conservation that is largely driven by a single species uh, ignores the need for uh, the entire ecosystem. Um, and, I, and I went to, a, a, I, I did a presentation at a conservation meeting in Mexico, and I thought everybody was going to kill me, but I was surprised 
with a lot of biologists that are working in conservation in other parts of Mexico, they came to me and said, wow, this is great. We've been saying, why is all the money going there when there are other regions where we are actually doing conservation with the communities? So I was surprised at that. The other point is fortress conservation. And the idea of fortress conservation, and I think these ideas come more from the US. And they are trying to be applied in a less developed environment, which creates all sorts of problems. Yeah. So the other one is fortress conservation. Fortress conservation basically is the idea that a protected area should exclude humans, human use. So we have the national parks in the US. When the national parks in the US it, when it were created, it was easy to do because they just had to get rid of Native Americans, who didn't have a lot of, you know, a big voice, right? Here in the Gulf, no, it's not happening. People have a voice and they are, they've been screaming quite loudly. So um, it is tragic to see a species decline. It is very sad to think that it's going to become extinct, extinct maybe. But my question is, we need, we need to look at ethics and we need to put things in a balance. And just to end, can I do one more thing? <laughs> Quickly, the impacts, food security, this I have seen in the past four years, how not, they are not eating fish, they are not eating shrimp, they are eating processed foods that they find in the supermarkets, the level of obesity is increasing, there are pro a lot of health problems that people are talking about, this is a problem that all of Mexico is suffering. But we have pockets like this community where, where actually they were very healthy, um, so that's that point. Mental health problems. Imagine a bunch of men and young men with nothing to do. That is, for me, it's completely irresponsible. To say that the communities are in crisis, yes, they are in crisis right now. But they were in crisis. Again, I've been going to these communities for a long time. Um, loss of cultural knowledge, and that is sort of my topic dear to my heart. We're going to lose a great deal of knowledge about the upper Gulf of California environment if these fissures completely, you know, if, if this continues, if the ban continues. Illegal fishing, it is an opening up of illegal fishing. Um, I don't know how many fishermen are involved in illegal fishing. Uh, I think a lot of them are not because they are afraid. They don't want to be in jail. I think the, there is a lot of... Um, Drug money involved, drug cartels have gone into places like this where uh, there is an opening. And there is an opening because fishermen are not outside patrolling. They are in their houses try trying to figure out what to do. In the past, and fishermen have told me this, we used to see a totoaba net and we would take it out. Right? Now they are, and they propose that to the government. Let us take out the nets. We know where they are. We know where the totoaba are. We know when the season starts. We know everything about this. Let us participate, and, but let us fish our shrimp and all of other stuff that they do. And then displacement, which eventually becomes a problem. Again, we think about migration to the US. Well, this is what creates migration to the US. It happened in the agricultural sector. Now it's happening in the fisheries for different reasons, right? Climate change, I didn't even talk about that. All yeah. kinds of things. OK, that's it. And there's a really good book called Conservation Refugees, which actually looks at these in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs>